reveling the UDG galaxies in the Romulus C galaxy cluster simulation. Please. Thanks. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Good? Great. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, ultra diffuse galaxies, their formation, their evolution in cluster environments using the Romulus C galaxy cluster cosmological simulation, one of the only cosmological simulations of, of a galaxy cluster with full hydro that can actually resolve dwarf galaxies self-consistently. So this will be the first self-consistent study of UDG formation in a cluster environment. Uh, and I'm glad that, uh, that Aaron gave a little bit of an introduction to this. I guess I'll be in favor of the vanilla uh, picture that he was talking about, where ultra-diffuse galaxies, hopefully I'll convince you, the form through ram pressure stripping of their gas in the cluster environment. This is the main way in which the cluster environment is going to help the formation of UDGs. Uh, and then once that galaxy quenches, passive evolution of the stellar population then results in a low surface brightness dwarf galaxy that we would consider an ultra diffuse galaxy. Uh, so before I get started, I want to do a quick shout out to my collaborators on this, and in particular, Anna Wright, who uh, is still here, who had a poster earlier this week. Uh, she's been integral in this work as well as work she's been leading looking at ultra diffuse galaxies in a variety of other environments using the same physics, the same resolution simulations uh, in groups, in Milky Way halos, and in isolation. Uh, so, so definitely talk to her if you have a chance. Uh, so luckily, uh, I don't have to spend too much time talking about the background on this, right? There's this population of ultra diffuse, low mass galaxies, very low surface brightness dwarf galaxies uh, that are typically found, at least so far, in cluster environments. Uh, and the, the question is, is what is the role of the environment in shaping their formation and making them special in some way from the average dwarf galaxy that we see in the field or in lower mass halos? Uh, and so far, uh, there's been a lot of theoretical work that's been really great in trying to understand the UDG population. Unfortunately, uh, you're stuck either with some semi-analytic models or cosmological simulations of relatively few systems, either in isolation and in high resolution, or in low mass systems like Milky Way or, or small group size halos run at relatively poor resolution. And so the next step in this to really understand this population we're observing is to self-consistently model the evolution of dwarf galaxies and clusters to predict this population self-consistently. And that's what we do uh, with the Romulus C simulation. So uh, Tom, a couple days ago, already gave a nice introduction to the Romulus simulations. Uh, they're a suite of large-scale, high-resolution cosmological simulations with uh, 250 parsec uh, spatial resolution and 10 to the 5 solar mass mass resolution. Uh, we have a uniform volume simulation, which goes from you know, isolated dwarf galaxies all the way to galaxy groups, uh, as well as a galaxy cluster zoom-in simulation, Romulus C, uh, of a 10 to the 14 solar mass cluster that I'll be talking a lot about today. Uh, I usually talk about black holes when I'm talking about Romulus. Uh, I'm not going to talk about black holes today. I'm going to talk about dwarf galaxies. But I should note that one special thing about Romulus is it does model black holes and dwarf galaxies. Uh, Ray Sharma, who's not here right now but was here earlier this week, is doing work on studying the effects of black holes and dwarfs. Uh, but like I said, I'm going to be focusing on dwarf galaxy stars uh, and not so much their black holes in galaxy clusters. Uh, if you care about gas and clusters, uh, Irina Butsky, who also isn't here, but was here earlier this week, has been leading work on that. Hopefully you got one of her cool hologram cards that she was passing out, which I think are the, the best thing ever. Um, but, uh, so what, what I'm going to be doing here is leveraging the fact that Romulus C is one of only two simulations of this type of a galaxy cluster that can actually resolve dwarf galaxies in a cluster environment. There's no other simulation that can do that, except for TNG 50 is the only one that comes close. Uh, and so I'm going to be leveraging this to actually look and see, do we see these ultra-diffuse galaxies and, and what is their origin uh, predicted purely by the simulation? So what we do, we take the simulation at redshift zero and we fit single Cersic profiles to all of our dwarf galaxies. Uh, well, to all of our galaxies, we don't assume they're dwarfs. Uh, and then we pick out those with particularly low surface brightness and particularly large effective radii, essential surface brightness and radii. Uh, and these are our UDG population. Total in the cluster, uh, within 1.5 R200, we find 122 of these galaxies. These galaxies. And so we ask the question, OK, do these galaxies look different than the average dwarf galaxy population? Uh, the first thing to look at is the size-mass relation. So uh, in, in gray, I'm showing the dwarf galaxies in isolation from Romulus 25, our volume simulation. And we match quite nicely the size-mass relation, except down at these, at these low mass scales, we start to diverge a little bit. 
Um, in the cluster, in blue, we're showing non-UDGs. So first of all, I want to point out, not all of our dwarves are UDGs. Uh, but we, we do f follow nicely the size mass relation again, to, except for, for the lowest masses, we begin to diverge. And then the ultra diffuse in orange follow the same general relation. They're part of the same galaxy population. They just have a higher radius at a given stellar mass. Uh, so there's not, nothing particularly special in terms of, uh, in terms of that. Uh, the same essentially is true if you look at other observables. The effective radius is a function of central surface brightness and total G-band magnitude. Uh, again, we see that the overall population in isolation, the cluster non-UDG population is similar, but then the cluster is able to populate this lower surface brightness region, which is only rarely uh, populated by isolated dwarf galaxies, and we'll understand why in a little bit. Um, and more importantly, we have also on here in, in gray and in these, uh, these diamonds, the, the observed population of UDGs in the coma cluster. Uh, there's a lot of them. And we, we match very well the, the overall sort of region in, in, uh, in this parameter space that UDGs are observed UDGs exist. So we have a realistic population of ultra diffuse galaxies. But they don't seem to be well separated out from the average population. They're just an extension of the overall population. And the same is true for their colors. In the galaxy cluster, not, not surprisingly, all of the dwarf galaxies are very red. So here applying the, the fraction of the distribution of G minus I colors, and then G minus I is a function of, uh, of total G-band magnitude. Uh, similar to observations, we see that, that lower luminosity galaxies tend to be a bit bluer. Uh, but similar to the observed uh, UDG population in coma, uh, all of our galaxies are red. Uh, but there's not much difference in color between UDGs and non-UDGs. Uh, so there's not a whole lot special in terms of the baryonic content, it seems, between ultra diffuse and, and non ultra diffuse galaxies in the cluster. The ultra diffuse is just an extension of this population. But as Aaron pointed out, maybe there's something special about their dark matter halos. So uh, what we do is we, we trace the galaxies back in time to when they just fell into the cluster before their dark matter halos had been stripped at all by the cluster environment. Uh, so look at the maximum halo mass and their, their stellar mass at that time. Uh, those are plotted in the, in the large points here. And so at that time, UDGs in orange, non-UDGs in blue, they all lie on the same stellar mass halo mass relation. They're all normal average galaxies. A galaxy of a certain stellar mass has a certain halo mass. This is the same for UDGs and non-UDGs. And then when they fell into the cluster, they sort of move over to this region over here because the, the, their dark matter halo is being stripped away, but their stars are pretty much the same. The same is true if we look at the spin of dark matter halos. Uh, so there's been some ideas that maybe UDGs form in particularly high spin dark matter halos. That's not what we see in these simulations. So in black, the solid black lines, I'm showing the, the spin distribution in isolated galaxies. And in blue and orange again, I'm showing the non-UDG and UDG populations in the cluster. UDGs in the cluster have average spins. There's some very slight indication that they might have slightly higher spins than the non-UDGs, but that's not very significant. Uh, and and they, they're, overall, they just look average. Um, so there's nothing particularly special. They're not representing some high spin tail of the overall dark matter distribution of dwarf galaxies. And yeah, just to make sure there's no mass dependence, I'm plotting this for, for three different mass bins in, in stellar mass for, for our cluster dwarf galaxies. So what we've seen so far is that dwarf galaxies in the cluster aren't special. They're not special in terms of their baryons and their, their observable properties. They're not special in terms of their dark matter halos. So how do UDGs form? Why do they form so prevalently in cluster environments and maybe not so much in isolation? So for this, we can leverage the fact that we have a simulation. We can trace these galaxies back in time self-consistently and look at how their properties have evolved over time. Uh, so here we're looking at the effective radius of these galaxies as a function of time relative to the infall into the, into the cluster. Uh, and again, using three mass bins just to make sure there's no mass dependence. Uh, so at the largest masses, we see there's some size evolution, uh, both before and after they fall into the cluster, but it's not very significant. And in all cases, the galaxies, by the time they fall in, whether they're UDGs or not, are all large enough to be considered ultra diffuse. They all have a large enough effective radius. Uh, at lower masses, uh, their effective radius is actually the big indicator uh, between UDGs and non-UDGs. The smaller galaxies are not UDGs. Uh, and they're smaller well before they fall into the cluster. So before falling into the cluster, these galaxies have some distribution in sizes. All it is is that the non-UDGs are typically the smaller end of that distribution, and the UDGs are the larger end. But the cluster isn't doing anything special to their radius that's making them UDGs. There's no dynamical interaction that's puffing them up in a short amount of time, on average. There might be isolated cases of this. <laughs> 
Now, one thing we do know that the cluster, do, cluster can do is quench galaxies. So this is from uh, my paper earlier this year, looking at the fraction of quenched galaxies as a function of stellar mass. Uh, in isolation, we see that low mass galaxies are almost never quenched uh, in the simulation, as you would expect uh, from observations. But in the cluster environment, low mass galaxies are almost always quenched. So the cluster environment, the, these low mass galaxies are very sensitive to being uh, quenched by, by the, being in such a dense environment. And so, indeed, this ends up being the really important factor here for these low mass ultra diffuse galaxies. So, what I'm plotting here again is the evolution of another important parameter, the central surface brightness of these galaxies as a function of time, this time relative to the time in which those galaxies have quenched their star formation. And what we see is that prior to quenching, these galaxies are all way too bright by one to two orders of magnitude at least to be considered an ultra diffuse galaxy. Uh, once they quench, that you see a, a strong evolution in the central surface brightness. And in fact, the stars here, I should point out, are the redshift zero values. So if you look at those, you notice a trend where the, the longer time that's been since you've quenched at redshift zero, the lower your central surface brightness is. Okay? So this, this evolution is critical here. This is what's allowing all of these galaxies to become ultra diffuse galaxies, is this evolution in central surface brightness driven by the quenching of star formation. And this relationship between, between lower levels of star formation and central surface brightness is actually true everywhere, not just in the cluster. So here we're plotting the central surface brightness as a function of stellar age within the inner one kiloparsec of the galaxy. As you go to older populations, whether you're in the field in isolation in black or in the cluster in the colored diamonds, you get a lower central surface brightness. The difference is, is that unlike the field, the cluster is really good at quenching dwarfs. In isolation, quenching dwarf galaxies is a lot harder. And so this is just an example of what this process looks like. So we have a star formation history of one of these infalling dwarf galaxies that's actually going to become our most massive ultra diffuse galaxy in the simulation. It falls in around this time, and already right after it's crossing R200 of the cluster, you see a strong tail of, of ram pressure strip gas, and as time goes on, that gas continues to be stripped. Star formation initially sort of gets stronger as that gas gets compressed. And then, eventually, that gas gets completely blown away by the cluster environment, and the galaxy quenches all star formation, and then is allowed to passively evolve over time. And so the same, the same galaxy I showed before, initially, this is, the central sur this is the surface brightness profile of this galaxy, shown in, uh, in blue a billion years prior to falling into the cluster. As it begins to get stripped, you get a little bit central, uh, central enhancement as star formation actually increases a little bit due to compression of the gas. And then you quench in this red line. And even when you're quenched, you're not quite a UDG yet. The passive evolution of your stars, decreasing your central surface brightness continuously at all radii, eventually makes you something that's by redshift zero, a very low surface brightness, low mass galaxy, which you would call an ultra diffuse galaxy. So it's purely the aging of a stellar population that's been quenched by the cluster environment. And this is something, uh, I think Aaron alluded to this as well, that's been seen in observations. So you, you take some red ultra diffuse galaxies with a very strict definition to be very low surface brightness. And you can also find these blue galaxies that look a bit bigger, but are, are higher surface brightness than you would call maybe uh, ultra diffuse. But if you just take that blue population and you evolve the surface brightness profile, uh, assuming just passive evolution of stars and nothing else, you get very similar distribution, a very similar uh, uh, profile to the red UDGs. So this is something we see in observations, uh, and so I think it's a, it's a very viable uh, thing, even though you know it's just a vanilla process, maybe slightly more boring than you'd like. Uh, I think it's interesting. So the, the main conclusion here is that, like I said, ultra diffuse galaxies in the cluster, they match the observed distribution of properties overall. Uh, so they're a realistic population of UDGs. Uh, they, but they, they form through this ram pressure stripping event. So ram pressure stripping, in particular the quenching of star formation, and then the passive evolution is the critical thing here to create a large population of low mass 
very low surface brightness galaxies. And before I get done, I want to point out again more details, right? We have this, this cluster simulation that, as I said, Anna, uh, Anna Wright is doing some great work in combining this with our larger sample. So combining the cluster with a volume simulation means we can look at UDGs in all environments with the same physics, with the same resolution. And what we're finding is a very good agreement overall with the number of ultra-diffuse galaxies we're predicting. Uh, and also, this cool prediction here that even in isolation, which is interesting, you have about 20% of your dwarf galaxies at all masses are ultra-diffuse. The formation system cannot be the same as the cluster because a lot of them are star forming. Uh, so I'll say you should talk to Anna for more about that. Um, I'll leave my conclusions up and I'll take your questions. Thank you. Hi. So you pointed out that the UDGs are larger even before falling into the cluster. Yeah. So, so like why is like like why are they larger? Like so, the, you said that there is no correlation with spin, but in yeah. the standard like the MoMA white picture would assume that galaxy sizes are correlated with spin and concentration of the halo. So yeah. So I think I, I want to point out a couple things. One is that you would exp you're not going to expect a ga galaxies to look the same. There's always going to be uh, a distribution of properties. And so all we're saying is that there's a distribution of sizes that's just an inherent distribution that is not, does not inherently correlate with spin. And the UDGs are a higher end of that, of that thing. But I will say that I sort of lied. The dark matter spin doesn't matter. Uh, but I have a quick extra slide if you'll let me show. There is a bit more evidence that the angular momentum of gas uh, accreted is also important. Uh, so I didn't actually mention this on the slide. Uh, I should have. Fry yelled at me earlier for not doing this. Uh, so we're, we're calculating the spin at T50, so while the galaxy is still forming most of its stars and before its dark matter halo has been significantly stripped. Uh, if you do the same for gas, so look at the gas angular momentum, uh, we do see that overall there's, a, more, there's a, a stronger trend with radius even in isolation. So if you look here, isolated galaxies that are small have preferentially much uh, more significantly different gas spins at T50 uh, compared to galaxies in, in isolation that are larger. And indeed, we see that UDGs do tend to have higher angular momentum of gas. Now, it's not like a, a huge difference. Maybe it's not as much as you would want to see to be like, oh, this is super special. But it's at least a clue that one possibility is that galaxies in the cluster are more likely to accrete high angular momentum gas. And this is also something where there's a clue in observations that this might also be the case. So, uh, so f just following the previous question, so UDGs have two defining features, being faint and being large. Mm -hmm. You showed a nice correlation between uh, like, uh, uh, the surface brightness and the quenching time. But I wonder just in the, in the, group, uh, in the cluster environment, maybe these two things happen together, like quenching happens at the pericenter, and being, being, being uh, like popped up, being larger, uh, can also happen at a peri pericenter due to tidal interactions. Uh, yeah, so as I showed, the, the galaxies often have sizes en enough to be UDG well before they fall in. So it is possible that there's still some size evolution in individual galaxies, but on average, that size evolution is not the critical thing that makes them UDGs. Uh, but I'll, and I'll also point out that in the simulation, we have a few UDGs that haven't even fallen into the cluster yet. Last question. In these simulations, either in the field or in the cluster, do you produce a population of compact dwarfs the way they are observed? Right, so that is, that is one shortcoming, right? So we do not form a lot of dwarfs below a kiloparsec in size. Uh, that's a pretty common problem with simulations. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's the thing that keeps me up at night, I, I agree. And I think, I think in general, it's, it's mostly important for our lowest mass population of, of UDGs where we're over predicting the sizes because we don't have the resolution to really model those very compact stellar distributions. Um, but, you know, best you can do with the, the highest resolution you can get at this size. But I agree. Yeah, I, I think there is a possibility we over predict at the low mass end the population of UDGs. I think so. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank again to Michael.